In this video, we work our first example problem in which we solve an initial value problem where the DE has polynomial coefficients. Here, we're going to assume that Y is a piecewise continuous function and it's of exponential order. And then we're going to solve the initial value problem using the Laplace transformation method. Now, since the differential equation has variable coefficients, we're going to be using the um, derivatives of a Laplace transform um, fact or theorem. We said that under certain conditions, the Laplace transform of t to the nth power times f of t is negative one to the n times the nth derivative with respect to s of the Laplace transform of f of t, which is f of s. Now we're going to use that over here um, whenever we've got a coefficient of y double prime or y prime that involves a t, um, that's appropriate here. So this is going to be a little bit different than all of the IVPs that we solved where the differential equation had uh, co uh, constant coefficients, excuse me. Um, since we've got variable coefficients, we have to use this. And that means we're going to end up with a differential equation in y of s rather than just an algebraic equation involving y of s that we need to solve. But we start in exactly the same way. We always introduce our notation. So we let the Laplace transform of little y equal big y. And then we compute the Laplace transform of the differential equation and substitute in those initial conditions. So if I'm computing, whoops, first I need to let Laplace transform of little y equal big y. Then I want to compute the Laplace transform of the differential equation. So we'll have Laplace transform of t times y double prime minus two times the Laplace transform of t times y prime plus four, um, oops, times the Laplace transform of y equals the Laplace transform of zero. Now this uh, term here and this term here are going to require us to use that theorem. That's just gonna be four times y of s and the area under the curve from zero to infinity where the curve is given by y equals zero is of course uh, zero. So this is zero on the right hand side. Now typically I do all of this in line, but because we're using this theorem, I think it makes sense to work this out separately and work this out separately and then substitute those in to um, this line here. So let's apply this here to this. So I've got an n equals one there because that's just a t to the first power. Matching the patterns, I've got n equals one. So according to this, we're going to have negative one to the first times the first derivative with respect to s of the Laplace transform of y double prime. And the Laplace transform of y double prime is something we learned earlier. Since it's the second derivative, we expect to have three terms. If you've got the nth derivative, derivative excuse me, expect to have n plus one terms. And we always start with s to the n. And then we're going to subtract and then let the powers of s decrease. Um, in this case, n is equal to two. So we'll start with an s squared, then we're gonna have an s to the first and then s to the zero, and then we've run out of terms. And then here we multiply by the Laplace transform of little y and then little y at zero and little y prime at zero. So the order of the derivative increases as you go from left to right and you've got that Laplace transform of y on that first, as a factor on that first term. And then of course you can substitute these in. Now that's a, a first power, that's not a prime. Um, y of zero is equal to zero. And we're told that y prime of zero is negative one from this. So now we're taking negative one times the derivative with respect to s of s squared y of s plus one. And this is a function of s times a function of s. So when we take the derivative, we'll have to use the product rule. So we're gonna have negative one times the derivative of the first, which is 2s times the second, plus the derivative of the second, which is y prime of s, times the first, which is s squared. I'm just gonna put that out front, plus the derivative of one, which is of course zero. And then you can distribute that negative if you'd like to. 
And notice that we've got, oops, um, a y prime of s term that's going to show up in the Laplace transform of that equation. So now let's look at this one. We're going to do the same thing. I've got a t to the first times y prime, and I want its Laplace transform, n equals 1. So we've got negative 1 to the uh, n, where n is 1, so this negative 1 to the first times the first derivative with respect to s of the Laplace transform of y prime. And the Laplace transform of y prime, um, if it's a first derivative, it has two terms. It starts with an s to the first, and then we have an s to the zero term. And then we'll have y of s here and little y at zero there. And little y of zero happens to be zero. Now, when we take that derivative, we're gonna use the product rule again. We've got negative one times the derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second times the first. And if we distribute that negative, we get negative y of s minus s times y prime of s. Okay, so we've got this to multiply by that negative two there, and then we can work everything else out. So let's substitute these guys into the differential equation. So first we should have the Laplace transform of t times y double prime, which was this right here. So we've got minus 2s times y of s minus s squared times y prime of s. And then I want minus 2 times the Laplace transform of t y prime of t, which is this. So negative y of s minus s times y prime of s. And then we want to add 4 times the Laplace transform of y, which is 4 times y of s. And that equals the Laplace transform of 0, um, which is, of course, 0. So now you have this equation in y of s that you need to solve for y of s. And it's a first order differential equation. So what I would recommend you do is that you simplify it and then see what type of first order differential equation you have. Um, I will distribute that negative 2. And then I would group the y prime terms. So I've got a negative s squared times y prime and a 2s times y prime. So that's 2s minus s squared times y prime of s. And then I've got uh, 2 times y of s plus 4 times y of s. So that's 6 of those minus 2s times y of s. So it's 6 minus 2s times y of s equals 0. Now. If I move this term to the other side and then divide, um, well, it's, then it's pretty clear that uh, this is a separable differential equation. So maybe I should write it this way. This is 2s minus s squared and y prime of s can be written as dy ds. And then if I add that to the other side, I'll have 2s minus 6 times y over there. Let's divide both sides by 2s minus s squared. And those guys reduce. It's also helpful to divide by y and multiply both sides by ds. And then those guys will reduce. And so what we'll end up with is 1 over y times dy, because dy ds times ds is dy by definition of the differential. And then over here, we've got 2s minus 6 over this expression. If you want, you could factor out um, an s. This is s times um, 2 minus s ds. And now that all the s's are on this side and all the y's are on that side, we can anti-differentiate both sides. On the left-hand side, we just have natural log of the absolute value of y of s. And that's going to equal that antiderivative. Since I've got a polynomial over a polynomial, it makes sense to use partial fraction decomposition here. So I will rewrite this in this way. 
So I've got two linear factors, neither one of them is repeated. It's gonna give me an A over S plus a B over two minus S. For each linear factor that's non-repeated, you get a constant over that factor in the decomposition. And then you want to solve for A and B. One way that you can do that is you can multiply by the LCD on both sides. The S is reduced here and the two minus S is reduced there. And the two minus S is reduced there. And what we end up with is 2S minus six equals A times two minus S plus B times S. Then it's pretty easy to solve for A and B by just set, setting S equal to the value that would cause each factor to be zero. So this factor is zero when S is equal to zero. When S equals zero, the left-hand side is uh, two times zero minus six, which is negative six. And then we'll have A times two over there. And if we divide both sides by two, we get A equals negative three. And then I can let S equal two as well to cause that factor to be zero. And I'll have two times two is four, four minus six is negative two. If S is two, this is A times zero. And then I'll have uh, two times B here. So if we divide both sides by two, we get a negative one for B. So this is actually the integral of A, which is negative three over S plus B, which is negative one over two minus S. And if you prefer, you could just write that as a one over negative one and you could change the order there. And I think I do prefer that. So I have the integral of negative three over S plus one over S minus two, just bringing that negative one down and then distributing. And then I compute the antiderivative of each of these terms. So I have negative three times the natural log of the absolute value of S. And if U is equal to S minus two, DU is equal to DS. So the antiderivative of one over U is just natural log of the absolute value of U. So I have natural log of S minus two plus a constant C. Now I'd like to write this as a single logarithm. So I think I'll bring that three inside And that's legal because of this old property. You've got n times natural log of a. You can bring that n inside. That's natural log of a to the nth power. And I didn't bring the negative inside because I wanted to write this as a difference. Turns out that log of a minus log of b is equal to log of a over b. So in this case, this is my a and this is my b. You can think of that as log of a minus log of b. And so what we end up with here is log of S minus two over S cubed uh, plus C. Okay, so we're just a few steps away from getting Y of S by itself. And then we just needed to compute the inverse transform. In order to get rid of this logarithm, I will exponentiate both sides. E to this power equals E to this power. You can't just do e to this power equals e to this power plus e to that power. That's not how exponents work. But if a equals b, log of, or e to the a is equal to e to the b, that's fine. And then the exponential and the log with the same base undo each other. So we'll have a y of s over here. The absolute value would lead to a plus or minus on this side. And then over here, I can think of this as a product. Um, because if I have log of, or e, raised to the a plus b, that's e to the a times e to the b. Because if I had these guys, I would just add the exponents and get over here. I can use that in reverse as well. So this is actually e to the log of the absolute value of s minus two over s cubed times e to the c. Well, these, uh, the log, logarithmic function and the exponential function will undo each other. And that absolute value is sort of taken care of by that plus or minus there. And so we'll end up with y of s equals plus or minus e to the c times a different plus or minus. It's just a different constant. I'm gonna call that constant c1. And we're multiplying by s over s cubed, which can be simplified to one over s squared minus two over s cubed. 
All right, so we finally got y of s by itself. Then it required solving a separable differential equation. And now if I want to get y of t back, I just compute the inverse transform of y of s. Uh, since the inverse Laplace transform is an integral operator, that constant can be pulled outside. And I just take the inverse transform of each of these terms. Well, the inverse transform of one over s squared is t to the first. The inverse transform of two factorial over s to the two plus one is t squared. So that's my y of t for some value of c1. In order to find that value of c1, I want to use my initial conditions. Now our initial conditions are that y of zero is equal to zero. And we see that that's already satisfied. If t equals zero, y um, is equal to zero. So that's fine. But the second initial condition says that y prime of zero has to be equal to negative one. So let's compute y prime. That's gonna be c sub one times one minus two t. If I evaluate that at t equals zero, I get c sub one times one minus two times zero. So I just get c sub one. So that means that c sub one, that's the value of y sub zero must be equal to negative one. And that means our solution to the differential equation is y of t equals negative one times t minus t squared. And if you distribute that negative one, you get negative t plus t squared or t squared minus t. Now it turns out that function is a solution of this differential equation. Notice it has um, variable coefficients. It's not a constant coefficient equation. It's not a Cauchy-Euler differential equation, um, but we were able to solve it using the Laplace transformation method because we are aware of this theorem. Um, now we weren't able to solve it in general, but we were able to sub solve it subject to these initial conditions, um, knowing what we know about the Laplace transformation. Um, so that is our first example of solving an IBP where the differential equation has polynomial coefficients. We'll do another one in the second example um, where the fact that y is piecewise continuous and of exponential order comes into play when we're solving for um, little y of t. So we'll do that next time.